Father, we thank you that you are our deliverer. You are mighty. You are great. You are the one who moves upon us and in us and through us. And Lord God, we want to be more operating the spirit than we are in our mind, more in the spirit than we are in our flesh, more and more in the spirit. We want to be bound to you and not bound to things that are evil that control us. And so, Lord, give us insight and wisdom as we approach this subject here tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. So we know that when we ask God for wisdom, the word says he'll freely give it to us. Like there's no charge, just freely. You ask him and it's like, bring it on, God, right? And wisdom we've talked about um, many times, um, just going back to rehearse over it, is that wisdom sees the past, this is where I came from, and how you got to the now and where you're going in the future. And whenever that's blocked, um, we end up getting stuck. So when we look, at, we look at the past and we're just stuck in the past, stuck in the past, or we're stuck in the now because of the past, we're stuck. Any of those, those things is kind of like a clogged pipe and God wants to open that up because he wants us to head toward the future, embrace where we came from, know where we are now and make a plan for change, yeah. right? People without a plan have a plan to fail. Right. And so we're here now to make better plans is what we're here to do. Um, so I want to start out by um, talking about, uh, for the first section, we're going to talk about life commands and vows. Um, and we have to understand what a life command is or what a vow is before we can really move into soul ties. Now, one thing I will tell you is that I have had phone calls. I've had people approach me and say, I don't even know if soul ties are scriptural um, because, you know, it's not like First John says, and your soul's tied to this or that. Um, and, and a lot of times we'll refer to it or have experienced somebody explain it, that it's totally regarding the demonic. Like, you have a soul tie. You're tied to that. You know, and that's the only description of a soul tie. It's, it's just, you know, somehow there's a demon involved and you can't get away because you're tied to this thing. Well, there might be. But that's not the only description of a soul tie. And, and so we have to understand, uh, first of all, what your soul is, yeah. right? You are spirit first. Your soul is your interface between your spirit and, uh, and God and your body. And so it's that part that is your mind, your will, and your emotions. Yeah. Your mind, your will, and your emotions. So your mind is that thinking part. It's the intellect. It's the ways of thinking, it's the belief systems that come out of knowledge and understanding. And your mind registers that. Now, if you just took your mind by itself, no spiritual part to it, it's a computer that just registers information. It's kind of really dry without your emotional state or your spiritual state. It's just information is now going in the computer. That's kind of how it is. But what's interesting is when you light up what you now have learned by the spirit, uh, and then add some emotion to it. Well, that information takes on a whole different character. It's not so digital. And, and so we have to know that um, it is mind, will, and emotions. And that, that's what your soul is. And I think we have a slide on that. Um, will is the area of choice. Your area of choice. Uh, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Now the word will there means his precepts, his commands, his ways of doing things, right? There's a different type of will. There's a will that says, I bequeath this to you. You get my land, you get my whatever, and I'm willing it over to you. There, there's that. And then there's the choice of your will. There's your choice maker. And there's an area in the brain called the cingulate that we make choices with. And when that gets stuck, uh, we're in trouble. And when that's um, shut down, we're in trouble. It is the area that really reflects and shows that we are, are created in the image of God and we're meant to move forward in faith. So we're meant to make choices that move us forward, choices that move us forward. Because we're coming from our past to our now and we're going somewhere. And so when it ends up going differently, when there's some type of life command, which we'll get into, and, or some type of blockage that says, no, I'm stuck in the past, I'm stuck in the past, I'm stuck in the past. Well, now, how do you use your faith to go forward? I'll get to that because I, I got to solve this first. Because I know if I solve this, I know if I, I get at this or whatever, my future will just open up. And um, we need to resolve some things in our past. We need to bring closure to some things in our past, but we don't need to be stuck there. 
right? So there's something that happens when, when that takes place. So, so if we're in the past, that's one thing. If we're now right in front of us, just staring at the now, staring at the now, we have no measurement of really any plans of where to go because how you decide in the now to where you're going to go is you look at the big picture. That would be a wisdom way to decide things. So much in our society, though, has trained us to decide in the moment at the thing. That's why we spend too much at the store. Mm -hmm. right, I need that. Well, let's look at big picture. Should we, should we spread this out a little bit and look at where you came from? And that's probably where you should be going. Now do you need that? See, does that fit in? I mean, we need to be able to make choices, and we don't want to get stuck just staring at the now, and that's the only information we, we have. So we ask God for wisdom at the beginning of this, and he is going to rest wisdom on us that will go, ah, that's where I came from. That's what got me to here, but guess where I'm going? It's going to be good, and faith will come alive in that, right? So mind, will, and emotions. Uh, emotions are expressions of feelings regarding memories, beliefs, or ways of thinking. They're the feelings that go with your way of thinking. There's a, they're the feelings that go with your memories. They're the feelings that go um, with your expression, right? Um, there are feelings tied to that. So if your soul is your information, your choice maker, and the feelings that are tied to that, that's a pretty big area to have affected. Um, it is the area we have to rule. It is the area where strongholds set up. A lot of times people will uh, teach, you know, you'll see different books on like the stronghold all over this city and we've got to pull down the strongholds over the city or whatever. I think um, if you look scripture wise, there's not as much talk about that as there is talk about the stronghold in your mind. Because if you have a city where poverty rules over it, that means everybody there thinks like poverty. So you can go, I command that demon off. Well, okay, you might have some effect, but the thinking has to change. So um, there's more to uh, than we know. So, so here we are looking at mind, will, and emotion and just establish that. Now, when a life command takes place, a life command is something that you believe is truth. It can be a lie, but you believe it is truth to you, right? It's something that established in your mind, which is that informational area, and um, you make choices about it, and then it's driven home with your emotion, Life commands that are good can propel you into your future, into great things. Life commands that have developed out of trauma can be trouble. We can, there's big trouble that comes out of that. And um, a life command can be something uh, like this. It can be that you uh, were traumatized uh, through sexual abuse. Maybe you were a grade schooler when it happened. So you can look back and you say, well, that was the event. Yes, but what thought built around that event? When a trauma happens, what happens is you have to decide. All crisis demands um, change, and all change demands decision. And so then we have to decide, what is it that I think about that event that happened to me? It hit my emotions. It registered in my mind. It blew up my soul. I don't even know what choices to trust in now. I don't know what to choose with my will. And if you stay in that state for any length of time, the life commands will start speaking to you. You deserved what happened to you. This happened to you because you're weird, you're flawed, you're defective. Oh, you were chosen for this because you're ugly. Oh, this is your lot in life. I mean, it doesn't really matter uh, what the life command is. Something will come out of that event that then you say, that must be the truth for me. Sometimes little kids, when, when their parents go through a divorce, uh, will believe that a life command will come. Nobody tells them this. It just comes. They have this innate feeling that says, if I'd have got better grades, dad would have stayed. And so all their life, they're running by a life command that says, you better get at that schoolwork. You better learn. You better really prove something because you never know who's going to leave you if you don't get good grades. See, there's a, there's a sensation that goes behind that. Now, take that, that thought even further. If that was the life command that you believed, now approach God with that life command. Please don't leave me. Don't, don't, don't abandon me. Don't wanna, I will try harder. I'll read the Bible more. I'll get at this thing. And please, please, God. See, we're following something that is a belief system that actually becomes a command to you. You can say, I don't want to do it, but you're driven to it. I don't want to believe it, but you get sucked right into it. It's like, oh my goodness, I'm doing that thing again. 
Uh, I'm performing for God again. I'm, I'm chasing people again. I'm doing whatever it is that's a dysfunction. But it's a life command that maybe you even recognize it's wrong, but there's something there that says you're stuck doing this. It's a command for you. See? Um, there's many different stories I could share, and maybe later on I, I will do that. But all of us come up with some life commands that are so good because God has imparted truth or love into us. We come away from that situation. It just solidifies truth, and it solidifies the fact that this, this is how I'm going to live. God is good. It just does that. But when it does the opposite, it will start to direct you and it drives you. Now, remember this rule, the devil always drives you and God always directs you. So whenever you feel pushed, say, back it up, buddy. I don't have to listen to you. I don't have to listen to my flesh that's freaking out right now. I don't have to. Everything's going to come to peace because I'm going to hear from my God and he's going to speak to me. He's not going to drive me. He's not here with a whip. I'm, I'm nobody's slave, right? Right? Because it's slave talk, really, to be driven. Come on, get back to work. Come on, you got to decide. You got to, you know, it's almost like that feeling will just kind of drive you. And, and so we know that if you're, you're driven, it's not of his kingdom. But if you're directed, that's a whole different thing. So we're just setting out some rules here before we really start digging into things. So you know kind of what we're looking at. We're looking at freeing the mind, will, and emotions. And we're looking at um, any life commands that might be revealed to you throughout the evening as I'm talking about soul ties and other things. Now, out of a life command can come a vow. A life command uh, can be that you, you, know, you believe that, well, the reason my parents divorced is I, I was an ugly kid. I mean, I've counseled people. That's what they believe. They come out. I mean, I, I mean, why stay together? There was something wrong with me. I must have been the one that drove them apart. Sure, they fought and everything, but something, something there had to be me. I just know if I'd have been better looking, better this, better that, whatever it is. And, um, and so then we'll make a vow around that that says, and I vow because of that, that I will never Right? We'll make big statements. I will never let this happen to my kids. I will never, and here we're pulling the levers of the, of the vow that says how we're going to protect ourselves. We're not asking God to protect us, but by golly, we're going to protect ourselves because you never know when we're going to get traumatized next. So out of life commands come vows. And these are things that also drive you because if you made a promise to yourself, you got to keep it. The life command will drive you and the guilt of breaking the vow will drive you. So now you're stuck. Now, someone like myself, if I'm preaching the word and that word is truth and it's coming at you and it is alive and it's true, <laughs> it's going to come at you. You're going to hear it with your faith ears. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word. It comes in. It's truth. It should create a picture in you of what the word is saying. But if it has to get past a life command and a vow, sometimes it bounces off your ears. Sometime. We talked about this last uh, class that we did here. Um, you can go online and, and, and listen to filtered hearing. And, and so sometimes it'll bounce off or it'll go in and you heard something totally different than what was said. Totally different than what was said. I never buy into when people um, talk about other preachers or ministries or, or family members or whatever, like, you know what they believe. And uh, because I, I've heard so many times, you know, you know what Kenneth Hagin believes? Oh my goodness, he is off the wall. He believes this, this, and this. So then I'll go and I'll listen to everything I can get my hands on and he never said it once. He preached his completely opposite. But however they heard, what he said is what they heard. And it filters through any life commands you have and it filters through the vows you feel that you're obligated to perform. Some of you have a vow to fail. You can only be successful for so long, and then there has to be a fail. Um, it, and here's how one of those things can take place. It, it can take place like this. You're a kid. You're moving along. You're successful in school, whatever. Something traumatic happens. Sudden move, right? Got to change all your friends. Got to do that whole thing. And you go along, and there, it's another eight months maybe. Sudden move. And something else has taken place, and you move from place to place. A child going through that can come up with a life command that says, you can never trust for any longer than this amount of time. Right? So you're in a relationship. You hit that six-month mark. Already there's this edgy feeling. You'll have the edgy feeling before six months hit because you know something has to fail here soon. 
That's what the brain was trained. Something has to fail. And if you have any vows around it or life commands around it, it, it will feel like you're violating yourself to break that somehow. This is where sometimes people in recovery will be like, I'm past eight months and usually I fail by three. And there's, there's this, such an anxiety instead of a release of like, yay, I'm free. It's, it's this like, oh my goodness, another day free of meth. I wonder when it's coming for me. It's a belief system. It's established in the brain, the brain that says, um, you know, I know you vowed such and such, but you also have a personal vow that says you can't make it past a certain point. Your life command believes that. So we had to understand this first before we can go in and talk about soul ties. These are things that do tie the soul up. But once again, I want to clarify, a soul tie is not a demon. So I've had people ask that. Can demons operate through that? Yes. Demons can operate on and bug you about certain things. I mean, all over the place. But it's not because you, you have a soul tie doesn't mean you have a demon right? It's just something that you're tied to that you need to be released of. And, uh, and it gives you permission to move on. It gives you permission to move ahead. So um, we know that, let's go to Romans chapter 8. For those of you who brought your Bible, I want to go just take a look at a couple verses here. Hmm. I believe God wants to deliver some people here tonight. Can you believe with me for that? Yeah. Sometimes he does that through knowledge. It'll just hit you and you're like, I didn't know that before. Sometimes he does it through prayer. Sometimes he does it by a word he speaks to you during the time I'm talking. And I'm okay with that. If I, you block me out and suddenly he's talking to you, good. Good. I'd rather hear from him than me, right? So that's a good, that's a good plan. Um, <clears throat> there's something about a trauma that when it's not resolved, it shakes you and shocks you and you can't believe it happened and it comes like a suddenly or it comes over time and it's repetitive and it builds in around your brain or builds in around your synaptic nerves. And your recording in your brain um, will run those scenarios over and over. Your synaptic nerves will, will run that, like the scenario of moving all the time. You know, you said, well, maybe I shouldn't unpack my toys because uh, you never know. We're probably going to have to go again. You know, it's, it's that. So you're already, first it's a, a, it introduces as a belief, and then you're not sure you believe it. You're in shock about it, and it'll happen to you again. And then you're like, okay, this is something that's getting a little more common. And then after a while, hey, this is the way of life. This is how it rolls for me. I'm almost expecting this. I mean, it'd be weird for me to see something different. So now what it does is it cultures you to get in faith with it. So there's something we can do. Um, the cingulate in the brain is that area that makes a choice. If that gets stuck, you'll just keep rehearsing something over and over. Have you ever had that? I know little kids will do that. Mommy, can we go to McDonald's? Mommy, can we go to McDonald's? Yes, honey, I said yes. Can we go? Can we go to McDonald's? Okay, we, we're going to go over this again. <laughs> I need you to look at me. We are going to McDonald's. Okay, because I, I want to go to McDonald's, right, Mom? We're going to go. Oh, their singulate's stuck. That, they'll, that, that's what will happen. If a toddler's singulate gets stuck, I mean, it's for instance, they want to dig in a certain drawer, and you say, no, no, and you go to pull them away. Drawer, drawer, drawer. And this can go on for half an hour. You know, because it's the drawer, it's the end of the world. This is the only thing we can think about. There is no redirecting at that point. Must have that drawer right? And so um, a toddler that you can redirect, you'll say, you know what? We're not doing that right now. Let's go over here. What you're really doing is training the mind to change the subject or do a, make a different choice. But when a child's singulate gets stuck, I mean, you can talk to your blue in the face, right? You just got to pick them up and move them and they will scream all the way, drawer, or whatever it is they're going in there for, toys. And they're singulate stuck. When it happens to an adult, you repeat the story over and over over and over, and again, over and over. But you don't understand how that hurt me. But you don't understand how that hurt. And you'll work through the thing. Maybe you're working between a husband and a wife, and you feel like, okay, we got resolve. And the next day, I can't believe that happened to me. Your cingulate is stuck. It's an actual physiological thing, but I believe it has a spiritual force behind it. Because when it gets stuck, there's a belief system behind it that says that you can't move on, that it's never really resolved. You can't trust that it's ever really resolved. 
And um, so we better rehearse this again. So to get your mind renewed in that area, we've got to get some truth. Now, one of the things we know your will does is your thinker does is it, it sets things. And so this is how the scripture says it in verse five of Romans eight. For those who are living according to the flesh, they set their minds on the things of the flesh, which gratify the body. But those are living according, but those who are living according to the spirit set their minds. Yeah. See, we have the power to set our minds. So when our singular gets stuck, it's stuck towards something that is in flesh. It's some, something that, that is trained in our body. Now here's when many times we'll read this and I'll say, um, you set your mind on the things of the flesh, which gratify the body. So we're thinking, well, I'm not set on alcohol. I'm not set on going to sleep with the neighbor's wife. Or, I'm not set on that. But your brain is set on something that your body has been trained into. Your body carries the feeling of condemnation and your mind can be set on that. And you'll literally feel it in your body. Your, your, your mind can be set on things that maybe you don't, they don't gratify you, but if there's a life command there that says this has to be because this is who you are. And the crazy part of it is the test of it is if you took that same concept and tried to put it on your best friend, you would never do that. You would, you'd never say, well, uh, for Katie, I would, if she's got this going on, I told her and I gave her scripture and I, I prayed with her and I really worked with her because I'm trying to get her out of that mind thinking. This is wrong. I don't want her to think like that. I've got to help move her forward. We'd never say the same thing to our friend, but when you know it's a life command for you, it's truth for somebody else, right? It'll work for somebody else, but it won't work for you. Something's stuck. There's a set, there's a setting in your brain that needs to be offset. It needs to be changed. And um, some settings are on a timer. And you know, anytime now it's going to get triggered. And there it is. Some are an everyday thing. I can't get my mind off. This is just set on this. It's just set on this. Well, it's supernatural. Uh, along with, uh, you know, training of the brain. So let's read this again here. I didn't even read the whole thing. For those who are living in court to the flesh, they set their minds on the things of the flesh, which gratify the body. But those that are living according to the spirit, set their minds on the things of the spirit, his will and his purpose. So now the war is on. If we're going to break a life command, if we're going to stop a vow, the war is on. We can't choose our own information to come against the information we already have. Right? Because you are your information. Whatever information you have is what you're going to use. But we think that we can overcome uh, information by arguing with, with, with ourselves. How many of you have argued with yourself? I'm going to eat that cake. No, I'm not. I'm going to eat that cake. No. I, no, I'm not eating that cake. That's I'm not going to do it. Right? Five pieces later. You know, you got to cut them real small, though, so it feels like you're not really doing something. <laughs> Just a little slice, and then you come back. And then you got to come back ten times, but it's still a big piece of cake by the time you're done. Um, there's, so, there's something about that argument that our brain is not set up for. Us arguing with ourselves, we will lose every time. Because we've lost before means that there's a life command, a vow, and a lie tied to your argument. And so now you're going to try to fight that thing, right? You're fighting it in your own strength then. You're like, come on, I'm going to fight you. I'm going to win this thing. And I'm going to hit you harder. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, some people, they talk down to themselves to get their self together, right? They'll be like, you stupid idiot. You are going to stop thinking like this. Well, that's not really helpful. But that's what we feel because we're in this fight. And if you fight dirty, you'll fight with yourself dirty. You'll talk to yourself. <clears throat> condescending, condemnation, treat yourself like dirt, because somehow that's going to motivate yourself to get its act together, right? It's like, if I, if I push myself hard enough, I'm going to snap eventually, and I'll get my act together. It doesn't work. We set our thing, our, our mind on his will and his purpose. We got to look more to him, the author and the finisher of our faith. We have to set it on whatever you want, God. I know what I want, and it's trash, but what you want, I got to switch over to that. But there it takes a trust and a reliance on that. And what breaks our trust and our reliance in him are poor life commands. We don't really believe that he's going to answer for us. 
Yeah, but what about Mary? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, he's going to answer for her. I mean, I, I believe that with all my heart. With all my heart, she's going to get healed. With all my heart, I just believe. God, I believe. Okay, let's believe for yourself. Well, that's kind of edgy. We are talking about me. Yeah, and what comes up inside of you when you say that? What's wrong with you? Well, I don't know. I've prayed before and God has an answer. Uh, things have happened to me out of my control. I always seem to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. I always, you know, all of these different things are life commands that come forward that say, and so we're believing this is going to happen again. And the part that makes it hard is when we've had these things happen repeatedly, we don't necessarily want to war with that. And this is why we've cried the tears already. We fell apart already many times. We don't want to do that thing again. Because if I come up and I try to battle this and I lose, I don't think I can handle losing one more time. So we settle. Right? We just settle. This is, this is the territory. I'm going to be on this certain level. That'll be my life. Uh, you know, what about, what about Kim? Oh, Kim, she's going to be. I, I can see her sore. I mean, she's that person. God's just going to bless her. Yeah, but what about you? Eh, that's my level right here. When God wants to take us to higher ground, always wants to take us to higher ground. He always wants to add to us. He's El Shaddai. It's in his name. He's the all-sufficient God who adds to us. Psalms 23 says um, he anoints our head with oil and our cup runneth over. We, we can't even say, hold on a second. He's like, oh, sorry, I'm still pouring. Right? That's, that's how he is. But if we don't see him like that, we see him kind of rolling the dice. You never know. He might help me. Might not. Might get healed. Might not. There's a life command around that. And it comes out of poor experiences. In fact, we'll say that sometimes. Well, my experience has been, does God care what your experience has been? When you're going after things by faith, it's like, whoop-de-doo. I don't care what your experience has been. My word says this. Your experience didn't match that, but let's try again. See? And the world will take you uh, down a path where trauma will want to shake your world continually. For instance, if you believe um, that you're going to struggle continually with your finances, guess what's going to happen? You're going to struggle continually with your finances. Well, it's always been that way. It's always been hard for us, you know. It's just, I, I, I kind of feel, and then we'll build a curriculum around it and a belief system around it, <laughs> right? We'll write our own curriculum for us. And, and, and it sounds, it's not the word, but it'll sound like, well, you know, because I'm, I'm just trying to love God and in the ministry and the devil's attacking me. And, you know, I know this, that's what it is. It's totally, he's coming against me for 45 years. <laughs> right? There might be another thing going on here after 45 years, yeah. right? Maybe you don't know how to run your finances. You need new information. Nope. No, I don't think that's it. I'm pretty good at that. I'm pretty, you know, you got to lay everything out and look at everything. Maybe I stink at something and I need new information. Maybe that's what's going on. See, um, but we'll, we'll tend to like build a, a life command around it. And then we got to have a vow of how we're going to fight and war against it. And then we produce our own belief system. Well, this is my experience. This is, this is what I've always done. Now, my father taught me. Well, if you're talking about your father in heaven, that's great. But if it's your earthly father, that's chancy. Yeah. <laughs> Love him or not. That's chancy. So we have to get the information that comes directly from the throne of God. It's pure information. It's undefiled. He holds the physical world together and he holds the supernatural together. That's who he is. The scripture says that. And so it doesn't say he's supernatural, but we don't know what to do with physical stuff. No, actually, he holds that together. So if we get into his program, he's got a way of doing things. It will break life commands off of us. It's very uncomfortable, even if it's beneficial. The very thing you need is not what you want. You desire something else. It's just flesh. And so it's like kids will, will be like, but I want that. I want that. We need that. We want that. Well, it's actually not what you need. It's what you desire. God knows what you need, and sometimes that's the part that's really uncomfortable. 
I'd rather be uncomfortable in him than uncomfortable when the devil's eating my lunch. Amen. Right? I, I'll be over here. You can discipline me even, but I don't want that. Yep. I'll be uncomfortable over here. I'll cry those tears. I'll, I'll wrestle with my flesh. I'll speak to the, the, the things that are going on inside of me. I'll have to change my way of thinking. Man, that's uncomfortable. <laughs> because wherever there's a life command, there's a lie. Right? If you've got a good life command, there's truth attached to it. But I'm talking about the kind that hurts you. Wherever there is a life command, there's a lie. And let's say you bought that lie for 20 years. Then you get the I shoulda, coulda, wouldas when you realize, oh, I was thinking wrong all this time. There's a grieving that comes with that. you got to work through that. But I'd rather not go on for another 20 years doing the same thing. Let's grieve through it. Let's get this puppy rolling. Cry, whatever I got to do, puke it out. I don't care. I want to move on. Right? And, and, and you'll get good at that after a while. It's called suffering well. We have to learn how to suffer well. Our society teaches we should not feel pain. Don't feel pain. Oh, are you uncomfortable? Oh, here, let me get you a pillow. Let me, you know, uh, whatever it is. And that can be kind. But after a while, it's like we don't know how to suffer. Everything becomes extreme drama. And then we can't sort things out. Pain is not a bad thing when it's productive. Yeah. Pain's a bad thing when it's non-productive or it robs your life. But if I can come out of something after having suffered and I'm a changed person, I wouldn't go back and, and change what happened. Right. There's some things I've suffered in my life. I would not go back and change it. Because I'm like, yeah, but then I'd still be jacked up in that area. That's why my mind thinks. It's like because I felt like I was run through a knothole, but when I came out the other side, I was still standing with God and I was changed. Yeah. It's big. Yeah. It's big to have that. Um, but as you're being run through the filter of the truth, it, it gets rid of the chaff and it only leaves the wheat. It leaves the good stuff and it gets rid of the chaff. Um, you run through a filter, what's left is where he really wants to take you. That's something he can work with. There's so many illustrations. The Bible talks about, you know, a piece of coal under fire over time becomes a diamond. Um, but you got to have the fire, and that hurts. Sometimes we sing songs that um, I don't think we get the full depth of it. Send your fire, Lord. Send your fire, Lord. And then the next week, we're like, oh, this is, uh, I don't know what's going on with me. It's like I'm in this big battle. And I, well, you, you told him to send the fire. He's trying to turn you into a diamond. Right? I'm not saying to avoid that. But, but know and be determined. I'm ready for the fire. Right? I'm ready for it. Send your fire, Lord. And you brace yourself. And you pray in the spirit and you move on in him and he'll carry you through those waters. Yeah. Right? You'll walk through those waters and they won't overtake you. Amen. You'll walk through the fire and you won't get burned. Right. Scary though. Yeah. And we don't like that because that makes us uncomfortable. But how do we ever get pretty much anything without some form of pain? How do you save money unless you do it? That's painful. Yeah. But I wanted to, yeah. Well, I thought you said you were saving it. You know, um, you, know, you know what I'm saying? It's like everything is painful. Give, give a first grader five bucks and say, I want you to save that for the next three months. It's like you just tortured them with the blessing. You're like, here, I'm going to bless you with some torture. And there you go. Can't spend it for three months. Oh, right? That's the kind of thing the blessing does to us. But we ask, here's our, our, our American uh, mentality. We'll ask for the blessing like it's just going to propel us into this exaggerated emotion of just wonderful whatever. You know, it's like roses are falling, clouds are fluffy. We're just here, loving life. Right? You ask for the blessing, the blessing drives out the curse. And every life command that goes with it, it'll drive it out. It'll drive out your old way of thinking, and you'll be set free. Yeah. Now, what have you set your mind to? God's going to reveal that to you just because you showed up. It may be tonight. It might be two days from now. It might be six months from now. But once you know, you can't not know. So we're putting it into motion. The word came and said, if you want the things of the Spirit, you have to 
set your mind onto the things of the Spirit, right? Yeah. Um, and so what we do right now, I mean, even if the devil has been dragging us around by our feet and we just didn't know what to say to him, we didn't know where to put ourselves, we set our mind differently tonight by choice. It doesn't matter if you feel powerful. It doesn't matter if like, well, once I get my act together, then I'm really going to set my mind on that. Uh, you, you shouldn't have an act and you're not going to get together anyway. You have to set your mind on heavenly things because we live in an earthly world and that's easy to set your mind here. But you try to go to something that you don't understand or something that you've never seen or something that you've never experienced, that takes faith. You have to step out and it's like, oh, this is a whole new world that I don't know anything of, really. Um, and I don't care how old you are in the Lord. We, we've been taking ground for many years, me and my husband. Uh, but he always leads us to a new place we've never been. You know, you get good at the stuff you've been. You're like, yeah, I'm good at this now. This is great. This is, uh, we're maintaining this ground. And he'll go, actually, I want you to do that over there. What? How we don't know. How are we going to, ah. <laughs> and what happens is when you go to approach the new thing, every life command that you believe that's a lie will speak to you. It will come up and it'll tell you how impossible these things are. It'll move you into unbelief. It'll scream loudly at you various different ways. And then there'll be vows that will come up that you, that'll attack you. Uh, I talked to one person just in the workforce. I was sharing this this morning at Pine Tech. I walked to, uh, talked to a person who wanted to be an RN and she said, I always wanted to be an RN. I'm just not good at math. Okay. So she believes that about herself, and maybe she's not the top math person. I'm not the top math person, but I know I could be an RN. Because you push hard enough, you work hard enough, you get there. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I, I might have to flunk things a few times to pass. That's kind of how I look at it, like, well, that's the second time I flunked that. Maybe next time I'm going to pass, but I'm going to pass eventually. But her belief system said, yep, that whole dream is down the toilet because I'm not good at math. And so her vow then, the personal vow to protect that belief system says, don't even talk to me about nursing school, nursing anything. I guess I got to look for a job over here. Well, all the jobs over here is not what was in her heart. She always wanted to be an RN. So now she's looking in places that doesn't fit her gifting. That's torture. But the life command will keep her out of where she needs to go. And it established because somebody teased her in school. Right? And um, I don't care if you got grades to back it up or whatever. It's more an emotional thing than it is a smart thing. Learning's more of an emotional thing getting in your way many times than a smart thing. I'm convinced we can do a whole lot of stuff we never dreamt we could do. I'm pretty sure I could operate on a brain. Uh, I don't know how steady my hand would be, but I gave it a shot on something, you know. I mean, there's a lot of things I would love to do. They had a, they had a free welding class for women. And I told the guy, I'm like, man, if I could be 10 people, I'd do that just for kicks. Just to, just to know, I pulled it off. Be like, I can weld. What are you going to do? Nothing, but I can weld. I mean, I'm, I just want to know. There should be something that faith says, I'll try that. Faith says, I want that. Faith says, I'll go there. Faith says, I'm willing. Faith says, I'm ready. I'm standing ready to learn something new. See, the opposite, the life commands say, yeah, what about this? You're like, oh, I don't know if I can do that. That's a different kind of faith. That's a lie kind of faith. It's not built in the truth. Well, what about this over here? Maybe you could, well, you know, my brother-in-law did that, and I don't know if that's going to work out for me, because you know what I heard them say? This is a lot of our talk a lot of times. Just go to a little mom-and-pop joint for breakfast and sit there and listen. Well, I remember the time, and Fred, he did, and blah, blah, and then go on. And half of what's being said are life commands of poverty. It's not, how are we going to move ahead? Here's a great idea that I have. Here's what we could do tomorrow. This, no, it's like, well, I remember the time, right? And they'll have something good, and then they'll kill it with something bad. Yeah. And what it does is it gets us stuck, generationally sometimes we believe well the next generation coming up they're way smarter than us on the computer and all that kind of stuff I don't know what we're gonna do in the end I'm not sure it's like we're just stricken with we're done now somehow we're done what 
See, and then, then it'll cut off. And what happens is generation gaps come out of that because one generation stopped believing and they don't know how to associate with the next generation down who's now believing a new thing. They just stop believing, stop change, stop trying something new, stop whatever. I'd apologize for it, but I am gonna be that grandma pulling up on a motorcycle. <laughs> trying new things. I'm going to be like, I don't know if I can still do this at 80, but I'm going to try. I don't know if you got to put training wheels, whatever, but I'm going to be that person. And, and because there, there is a part where you have to hold to the fact that I'm going to continue on believing, which means when you're in faith, you're trying new things. And your old experience can't run your now right? Because when you operate in faith in your now, you can't help but not stay in your now. You're moving forward. Well, now I'm actually in the next moment. A moment ago, I felt this, but this moment I feel this, right? Yeah. Uh, a moment ago, I was sad, but I'm going for joy in the next moment. See, faith will move you ahead like that. But our life commands that come out our mouth, we hear certain things. They set an image in our heart, in our mind. It, 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 fills our heart, and out of the abundance of that trash, our mouth speaks. And that's our belief system. And that's where we limit. Remember I've said salvation takes the limits off? So salvation power is to take the limits off. So when God speaks in your life, somebody prophesies over you a word of knowledge, or the word itself says something to you and it becomes revelation, it never limits you, and that's it. Can't go any further now. No, that's the word damn. The word damn means to put limits on, right? That's why you should never go around using the GD word because now you're asking God to put a limit on somebody or something. And we have creative power that says, no, we actually have to take the limits off because we're moving forward. Right. Yeah, but my leg hurts. Yeah, but I'm still moving forward. <laughs> yeah, but I'm in a wheelchair. Still moving forward. I'll find a way. That's what's going to happen. And you get tenacious about it. But when you go to move forward, any life command that you believe that says it's not possible, it's too much, it's too little, too late, I'm too old, I'm too fat, I'm too skinny, I'm too dumb, I'm too whatever it is, those life commands will block you. And then when you go to break that and move ahead, your vows will come up and say, well, remember you promised not to hope again? Because last time you hoped, you got hurt. Last time you tried, you got hurt. So there's a vow there that says, yeah, I'm not gonna try that again. You made that promise to yourself? You're not gonna try that again. You're not gonna try to get that same job again. You're not gonna try to pass that test. You're not gonna... Somebody asked me um, when I went to get my motorcycle uh, test, I didn't have time to study and it's different, a little bit different than it is Colorado or Wisconsin, a little bit. And so I didn't have time to study and they said, well, aren't you, aren't you gonna flunk it? I said, probably will. I'm just going to go in there and flunk it and figure out what I need to, because I don't have time. This is my fast way of doing it. I'm going to go in there, flunk it, find out what was wrong, then I'll go back the next day and take the test and pass. And that's what I did. I flunked it by one, and I figured out, oh, that's the one I need to know. I'll make a shift, and I'm on my way to town anyway. Might as well just take the test again. But if you have the belief system, like a lot of people do, I watch them go in there, and they're like, I don't want anybody to know if I flunk. You get the test from the person, they're like, next, and you get that test, and your body's already shaking. You're like, I'm going. You know, it's, it's like this huge thing that the whole world will know if you flunk the test. <laughs> so I'm in there smiling, going, yeah, I'm probably going to flunk this. Because you have to reach to a point, like, I don't care how I'm going to move forward. If I have to flunk to move forward, I'm going to do that, because I don't have time to study for this. <laughs> See? Or I could have said, well, maybe next year I'll get my license. Next year comes, the same anxiety would be there. Still got to have the same time. Yeah. See what I'm saying? Then we postpone things because we're afraid. Because there's a life command around it. There's some belief system that says you should be ashamed. You should feel bad about yourself. You're different. You're not the same as other people. You're whatever it is. Dare to take a college class and flunk it if you have to. I'm just saying, it'd be better to do that and have tried than to never try at all. Yeah, amen. Well, I don't know if I should go to Teen Challenge because I don't know if I'll make it. Well, then you didn't make it. But it'd be better than sitting here using. Right, 
right? Yeah. Do something that says I'm going to move forward. And it doesn't matter if you fall flat on your face, you get back up, you fall flat on your face. Eventually, you will move forward. And you have to be that tenacious. But life commands don't permit you to be that tenacious because they're a command. Their command. I've shared this story before where my grandmother died, and, and uh, I asked my mother um, and family members, why did that happen? And it was, it was terrifying to me. I was nine years old and um, didn't want to go to her funeral. A whole big to-do had happened around that. And, um, and I said, why did she die? And this was what I said, I don't know, honey. Bad things happen to good people. So do you think I wanted to be good after nine years old? Right? I took that to heart. Well, bad things happen to good people. I don't want to get A's at school. So I would go and i get on the honor roll and ho! All of a sudden, I'd be off it. I wasn't thinking this, but my subconscious had picked that up, and I'd be on the honor roll, down to an F, on the honor. And they, they call people in to have, we don't know what's going on with her. She's like all over the charts, right? And then I had a friend um, who was helping tutor me. It was a high school student who was helping tutor me. Just the greatest guy, very loving. I just felt like, man, he's like a big brother. He's really cool. He was driving snowmobile through the woods, and a tree fell on him, and he killed him. So when I went to his funeral, because the whole school was let out to go to his funeral, I stood way in the back, and I heard within myself, bad things happen to good people. Right? I was 20-some years old when I broke that life command. Here's the crazy part. Bad things happen to everybody. <laughs> they just happen. In this er world, there will be trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. So there's going to be trouble around here. You're going to see some wicked stuff. You're going to experience some things. But that one life command actually directed my grades. It caused the fear and anxiety. I didn't want to, you know, I'd go so long doing my chores or whatever, and then I had to get in trouble. I had to cuss at somebody, do something or whatever, because you don't want to be good. Right? It was a driving thing. And I broke that, me and God, where I let that go, and I'm telling you, it might sound like a small thing to you, but there was a load that dropped off me. It was wild. I was like, I'm not afraid of being good. I'm not afraid of doing the right thing. The righteous are bold as lions. So if I wouldn't have broke that life command, how in the world would I be an evangelist? The righteous are bold as lions. You have to do the right thing. You have to be in the right spot. You've got to listen to God. You're after his righteousness so all these things can be added to you so you can bring the gospel to other people. Yeah. And all I'd have to believe is like, yeah, that's a little bit too good. So I'll share on the side every once in a while. It would erect my destiny, that one life command. I'm bold as a lion. And it's fun. It's fun. It's fun to be bold as lions. So now what happens is what we're trying to get free of is belief systems that we have. So that's the mind. Your, your will being bound by um, a life command that says you can't choose that. Don't choose that. You, you're stuck. Remember, remember what happened? You're stuck. Don't choose that. And then the vow that says, well, if you do choose differently, then you're betraying your belief system about yourself. So you have to vow to keep this. I vow that I'm not going to be good so that bad things don't happen to me. Yeah? Right before I got born again, our house caught on fire. My brother Mike was in a major car accident. My brother Roger got up from the table. He was a, a little seven-year-old, fell, split his, his bone from here up. They don't even know how he did it. He had two toys in, or a toy in each hand, and he just tripped and he fell. All in the same, like, week. Right? Boom, boom, boom. And it was just like, Ah, uh, talk about the anxiety, feeling like, uh, am I going to do good here? Do I pursue good? Because why are these bad things happening? Well, then I became a Christian, and there was anxiety around it because I hadn't broken that life command yet. It's like, what are we doing playing over here in this side where you believe that good things can happen when all this stuff takes place in my family? That would mean I'd have to hope. And whenever I've hoped... I fall off of that and bad things happen. I don't think I can cry that hard again. That's what we end up telling ourselves. I don't think I can go that far again and cry myself to say, I think I'm about to the end of that. So I don't want to risk it. And we'll back up and don't do anything. And the most dangerous person is the person who's undecided. 
Yeah, be in an intersection where you need to shift and go forward or backwards and you're undecided. It's dangerous. I'd rather put it in drive and be wrong and have to repent later, right? Doing my best to make the right decision and then find out I was wrong. Well, that's okay. I did try my best to move forward and God will, will uh, give grace me here. He knows my heart, and, and I'll move forward. Then to sit there undecided. Eventually, you have to decide on each thing. Yes. Don't let your cingulate get stuck in the memory. Yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but, over and over. Eventually, you have to say, stop it. I'm going to decide. And anxiety will hit your system because your life commands will come up and go, oh. whatever you believe in the negative, it'll tell you, what are you doing? You can't, what are you doing? You're just not going to decide that? You're going to like move ahead in that? I mean, are you okay with that? That's what your brain will do. Hey, your, the life commands will come up and do that. And any vows and promises you made to yourself will be there. Here's one I hear parents say a lot. When they've been through something horrible in their life and they have kids, they've already vowed that they'll never let happen to their kids what happened to them. But behind that vow, they'll make another vow. I don't care what happens to me. As long as my kids, right? Is that a God vow? You're like saying, I'm just going to open myself up to the devil, but I'll protect my kids. These are bad life command. It's a bad vow. And so we don't, we don't want to do that. We don't want to come into that belief system just because something bad happened to us. We, this is the belief that if you dig deeper, if you peel the onion deeper, why would we say that? Because we really don't believe that we can prevent, our boundaries will pre prevent, or we can stand up against something like the thing that happened to us ever happening again to us. We don't believe that we can stand up against that. But we can for our kids. Because we love them that much. Yes. Think about it. Don't you love you? Not really. <laughs> That's what we're saying. I don't actually really love myself that much. And um, so... Are you worth fighting for? Not as much as my kids. I'll fight for me. I'll take all of my energy and I will fight for my kids, but I don't know how to fight for me. Well, if you ain't there, who's going to take care of your kids? Mm -hmm. So you better have some boundaries. You better have some prosperity inside of you. Yeah. You got to learn how to love you so that you can properly love your kids. Yeah. See, a life command like that can destroy you and it can destroy your family. Um, it can also make you feel like you have to be in control of your kids in every waking moment because Lord forbid that anything, whatever happened that even resembles what happened to you, I got to pay attention to my kids. There it's my kids, my kids. Well, what's happened in your life? I don't know, but I got to make sure. Is that faith-based or fear-based? Fear. 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 <sighs> we, we, we can't do that. But the life commands where you take the majority of your energy now and you're putting it over-exaggerated in a certain area because of fear. Where God wants us to be balanced and put our energies and our prayers and our speech balanced, this is where the word sober is. Be sober, be vigilant for your adversary. The devil goes around seeking, like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. The word sober there means to be well-balanced. So to life commands and vows that are of evil will get you like this. You will be out of balance. And whatever it is that, that's really weighing on you, like, I'm doing this. This is the thing. I'm really doing Yeah, but what about all this other stuff that's just hanging out there? I don't know, but this is the thing. Well, you're out of balance. You're out of balance. You need to learn how to take care of yourself. You need to learn how to bring yourself back into balance. We need to get new information. There's something about you loving you in all of this. Well, here's, here's the, the life command that'll come out of that for most people. Well, wouldn't that be selfish? It'd be really selfish of me to actually care about myself, to take time for myself, to, to try something new, to experience and try to find my own gifts. I mean, that would be kind of selfish, wouldn't it? I should really not pay attention to me, take care of me, um, think about me, and come over here and just focus on these people. After all, Jesus was selfless. <laughs> now you just build a doctrine that's not even true. <laughs> well, he did die on the cross. Yeah, he laid his life down by choice. Yeah. But when he walked in this earth, he walked in authority. Yeah. 
Yeah. And he was doing his assignment wherever he went. My, you know, the little, you know, wimpy like Jesus that they many times draw where he's just walking. He didn't even have a place to lay his head. Poor little Jesus. <laughs> That's the God we're serving? I think not. He walked in power. And when he wanted to leave a situation, he just disappeared through the crowd. Right? When he wanted to calm the sea, he calmed the sea. When he went to the cross, he did it by choice. He could have walked off on that anytime he wanted to, but he chose to lay his life down. And so we have to know when, when to fight what battle, what hill to die for, when to lay our life down, and there is a balance in that. I'll do without for a lot of things, but I'll also not do without in other areas, right? Right? There's a balance that says, I still need this so that I can do that. Um, but if you have life commands that say you're not worth anything, that's the ma major one that gives people, you're not worth anything. No answer's coming for you. Really, I mean, who are you anyway that you should think to do something for yourself? I mean, that is selfish. That is greedy. I mean, there's all these things that are built in behind that. But we usually don't go around saying that. What we do is we avoid success. Yeah. To the point, religion sometimes, well, and I'm not talking, there's, there's a difference between walking around cocky and being prideful, but I, I've watched it where somebody, you know, can post a song on Facebook or a picture that they draw, very few comments will come, especially if it's from people that know them. I've watched this over and over, and I'm like, that is really intriguing, because a lot of people have a belief system that that's pride. Think about it. But then for another person, another person that maybe we're, oh, we're fans of or whatever, oh, they could sing anywhere and do anything or draw pictures or do whatever. It'd be like, oh, that is so, aren't they amazing? I just love them. They're just, oh. See, then we almost go to other ditch and we're worshiping the person. We're not sure where to put values many times. We're not sure just be able to say to somebody, great job. I like that. I like what you did. That's pretty cool. We're not sure. That's a life command that says, you're going to make them prideful. Now, I can't make anybody prideful. No. If you got pride, it's in your own heart. I can't make you prideful. See? It's in your own heart if it's there. Let's take a five-minute break, and then we're going to come back and deal with soul ties. <laughs>